Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arsblog.com. How are you? Hope you're keeping safe and well. Hope everything is okay with you and yours in your world wherever you are. Thank you very much indeed for being here. Thanks for listening as ever. It is a busy, busy, busy show today. So much so that it could have been made by bees because bees, as we know, are particularly busy as are ants. But ants, they don't do good podcasts. Anyway, like I said, it's a busy show. We have got some discussion of midweek Carabao Cup action, the players who are on the pitch and some of the players who weren't on the pitch. We've got some insight into our brand new goalkeeping signing, Alex Runerson. So we'll be talking to somebody who has interviewed him and who knows his career journey from Iceland to to Arsenal. We'll have some Liverpool chat a bit later on with one of the lads from the Anfield Wrap to give us a a bit of flavour, you might say, ahead of Monday night's uh, clash at Anfield, in which Arsenal will be looking to make it three wins in a row against the Premier League champions. This one, I think, will be a little bit different from the last one. Of course, there are Premier League points to play for, the Community Shield, etc., etc. But anyway, we'll be talking about that. As well as that, we've got a chance for you to win one of two T-shirts um, from 44T.com, an Arsenal t-shirt for you. So it's all in here between now and the end of uh, this particular show. So, you know, stay tuned for all that kind of crack, as they say. We are going to start with what went on in midweek, though Arsenal beating Leicester 2-0 uh, at the King Power Stadium in the third round of the Carabao Cup. Now, I've spoken on this podcast, and I think I've written on the website about how For me, anyway, it's kind of interesting to hear Mikel Arteta talking to the players in the games because there's no fans, there's no crowd noise, there was no crowd noise in the broadcast that I um, uh, uh, discovered, came across just by accident on the internet. It was just, it was just there. I just, you know, picked it up and I didn't know whose it was, so I just, you know, anyway. Um, But you know, there was no crowd noise, and there hasn't been for the Premier League games for me. And you can hear Mikel Arteta talking to the players in the various languages that he does. The other night, though, to listen to too much of Brendan Rodgers, for my liking, it wasn't wasn't the same as listening to, to Arteta bark out instructions in Spanish and then in French and then in English and, and what have you, the, this flitting between the many languages that he speaks. But Brendan Rodgers, I didn't realize this, and maybe you didn't realize this either, but his his managerial style on the sideline is like somebody talking to their dog. Because all you hear is him saying, good boy. Oh, good boy. Good. Oh, who's a good boy? Oh, you're a very good boy. Aren't you? Yes, you are. You're a great boy. Brendan loves you. You're a great boy. Good boy. Good boy. Kind of creeped me out a little bit, I have to say. I'm, I'm tempted next time we're playing Leicester to put the fake crowd noise on. So I didn't enjoy that bit, although I did enjoy the Leicester midfielder whose name sounded like a Channel 5 version of Downton Abbey, Jewsbury Hall. I think it was his debut as well, so congratulations to him. But all I could think about was butlers and servants and top hats and carriages and vast open lawns and estates every time he got the ball. Uh, That could be my issue, though. And certainly not his. Anyway, to talk more about what went on on Wednesday night, I'm delighted to welcome from Football London, it is James Benge. Hello, James. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. Now, I know that much of the focus after this game was on a certain someone, and perhaps we'll talk about that certain someone in a few minutes' time. But... Uh, I think there were things from this particular uh, game, even if it wasn't the most exciting one in the world, that we could look at and talk about uh, which don't involve a certain someone. And I think what occurs to me is that this is, despite the fact there was a Carabao Cup game, a game in which Arsenal started five Hale End Academy graduates. Ainsley Maitland-Niles, Bakayo Saka, Reese Nelson, Joe Willock, Eddie Nketiah. That's a really positive thing, uh, you know, for a club like Arsenal. I know that this has been often the case with the, the Carabao Cup, that young players are are used in this competition, the League Cup, whatever it used to be called. But these aren't really um, just youth players anymore. They're sort of young and up-and-coming players in the first-team squad. And I think that's a really positive thing to look at. 
Yeah, it's interesting that you you picked that out, out because I kind of really didn't notice it before the game. It, it just felt natural, and then you kind of have to do take you do take that step back and you go, "Wow, half of the team here is is players that are homegrown from Arsenal." And you, you equally, you know, there are some supporters that have doubts about maybe one or two, whichever of those players. But you, you never you you knew what you were going to get from them. You knew that there would be you know intensity that Nketiah would be constantly looking for those runs in behind. Nelson, I thought was he played like someone with a point to prove, which obviously uh, he does have a point to prove. Um, mm. He's not particularly desperate to go out on loan. Um, it's interesting to see someone like Joe Willock just establishing himself as reliable. And I think going back to what you said, one of the the really important things that Arteta. And actually, to an extent, Emery as well has done is, is blooded these players often enough that we as supporters, as followers of Arsenal, we know what we're going to get and they know what they know what they can deliver, what's expected of them. It was really interesting after the game Joe Willock was talking about. He just felt absolutely empowered to pop into Mikel Arteta's office and um, ask him, boss, how do you see me playing this midfield role alongside El Nenny? What, what is it you want from me? You know what they're bringing you. Willock brings you that intensity, that verticality. His, his final pass is sometimes a little bit astray, but it's great to, to have these players you can just rely upon, that you've, you've, grown, you've grown yourself. Um, grown is probably not the right word, but sure. you know what I mean. I know what you mean. And I think what's interesting is they all kind of bring something a little bit different. And I know I realize that they're different players playing in different positions. But what I mean by that is that Malon Niles has the ability to play left and right, full back or wing back. Saka, we don't quite know what he's going to be. Uh, the Tim Stillman campaign to make him our, our third midfielder is well and truly underway. And you can see some logic in that in the way that he plays. And Ketty, a penalty box striker, different from, from Lacazette, maybe not quite as different from Aubameyang as Aubameyang used to be in terms of where he, he used to finish from. But he's very much a penalty box striker. Joe Willock, far from the finished article, I'll accept, but, but you know, he's the kind of midfielder who, and there was an, a, an example of this last night where he made a really good tackle deep in our half and the mm. ball worked forward and then all of a sudden he was essentially the furthest, one of the furthest men forward. He was a fur- certainly the furthest midfielder forward. So that ability he has to contribute between the boxes and, you know, I don't want to say he's a box-to-box midfield player, but he really likes to get forward and get into the box, which isn't the case with... An El Nenny or a Xhaka, for example. Willock is uh, Willock and Nelson are the two I find the most intriguing because the the thing with your Sackers and your Nketias is you already see a, a role for them. I don't know if Nketi will be Arsenal's number nine long term, but you know you can see them building a healthy career at Arsenal. Um, Willock and Nelson, you know, they're, they're already this. They, they seem to prompt a lot of debate, and I think sometimes there's a frustration over a lack of end product from the pair of them. That, that seems to not go hand in hand with the fact these are guys that have played 50, 60 games for Arsenal at most. And while that's a, a healthy amount, that they're pretty much the only professional games they've played. I would be really intrigued to see what happens with Willock because I can't quite put my finger on what his career could end up being. He he, he could be... I, I look at him and think he could be a, a starting mid, central midfielder for Arsenal one day. Equally, you know, if things don't quite go right with him, if he doesn't develop in the right way, you know, I can see him not really making it that that high in the Premier League. He seems to be one with a lot of variance. But what I love about him is it, it's just that dynamism, something that that Arsenal midfield is really lacking. And, you know, we'll talk about transfers maybe, but, you know, that Thomas Partey is the only one that, you know, on that list as well that could could bring a, a verticality like what Willock has. But, you know, I haven't seen him in the under-23s as well. If he gets in and around the box, he can score goals. You know, he, he does make good tackles. It's always going to be tough for him because he's not going to have a run of games. He's never going to, or not this season, he's not going to displace Xhaka, Ceballos and anyone else that comes in. Mm. So the challenge now is how do you develop someone like that with minimal time when he might be only be playing once every two, three weeks? And make sure he doesn't kind of go lower in your estimations and yeah. and not develop quite in the right way. Because I think if if you were in a position to give him game time consistently, you could make something really special out of Willock. I think he's got all the raw ingredients for a, 
a good Premier League player. I tend to agree with that. And I know a lot of people are a bit doubtful about Joe Willock. And I can understand why. I, I think sometimes we forget that he's only 20. And you look back at some of the midfielders who've made it at Arsenal down the years. And I don't even mean in recent memory. But, you know, it, it can take a bit longer than being just 20 years of age before your your game is refined, before you develop properly. I mean, he did score more goals than any other central midfielder for us last season. I know a lot of them were in cup competitions, but he does have that ability and that ability to arrive in the box. And, you know, people bemoan the absence of someone like Aaron Ramsey, a central midfield player who can get forward and score. He is the guy who can do that. What I would say, though, is I think this is true of him and I think it's true of... Um, Reese Nelson as well, is that they're kind of at a turning point. And I think you're right to say that perhaps they're not going to get the run of games that they need to develop in the way that we might want them to develop at Arsenal for the future, unless maybe they go out on loan. And I know that Arteta wasn't going to be drawn about Reese Nelson. He was asked about it uh, after the game, whether he'd be going out on loan and said, look, we're not going to discuss internal things. I think the same could be true of Joe Willock, that if you do, or if Arsenal do make the kind of midfield signings that we as fans want them to make, it, it means the pathway for Willock right now is certainly a little blocked off. So he is somebody, I think, who who um, can do enough for us in League Cup, in Carabao Cup, in FA Cup, and, and this sort of particular substitutes role that he seems to play under Arteta. Equally, though, I think he, uh, along with Nelson, could benefit more perhaps from regular first team football, whether that's in the Premier League or even Championship. I really agree, um, and it's it's a tough decision because you want these these players to to develop at Arsenal to be one club men, um, you know, to to come fully formed like Saka has. But people, players like Saka, are once in a generation, and you can still mould. Nelson um, and Willock into top players, but it's just if, at some stage, if if you want to trust them to play thirty eight games for Arsenal, you need to know how they cope with playing thirty eight games in a season. Mm. You're not you're not in a position to try and work that out with Willock. I would I would be really intrigued to see him in a maybe not even a particularly easy on the eye, a more robust Premier League team where he's. You know he's having to learn his tackling, um, and but they, you know, not a team where he he needs to play the Arsenal way because I think at the moment he can sometimes be brushed off the ball a bit easily. He's someone that you can get at. It's not what like he was when he he first came into the team under Wenger, but I think he needs to to work maybe a little bit more on that physical side of him. For Nelson, it's just about it's just about having a run of games so that every time he plays, he doesn't feel like. He has to make the big impression. He has to have the standout moment. Yeah. Um, and I thought that was really apparent with Nelson last night. Was he felt? It felt a bit like he was forcing things, and he can force things. That that early shot that that hit the um, the top of the bar was was really fantastic. It was a great move, and you saw then Saka was begging for the ball on the outside, but Nelson was very much like, yeah, you know, I am going here. I, I it felt almost unfortunate for Nelson that he has one of the best young players in Europe outside him on the left flank because it, it's so much harder to, for, for Nelson to shine when there's such a brilliant young star next to him. Yeah, the game time for him will come. I know, I spoke to a few people who know him well throughout the summer and for most of the summer the view was Reese really doesn't want to go. Uh, he wants to, he, he knows that Arteta rates him highly and he wants to get his chances. Dream obviously is to play for Arsenal week in, week out. I think, though, when the season gets going, the harsh realities of Arsenal needing to win every football match they play kind of hit hit you for six if you're someone like Nelson. Mm. And there's just no space for you on the bench. And there are a lot of Premier League teams where there would, at the very least, be a space on the bench for him. And I think get someone like Nelson out there, get him playing week in, week out. We've seen with a run of games at Hoffenheim, he can... He can do great things, and I still would no be not be anywhere near thinking about selling these two. Get them game time and see where you are again in a season. Yeah, absolutely, totally agree. Um, let's talk Saka though, because 
He is just such an exciting talent, isn't he? I know people, look, the short-term nature of the way we look at games and analyse games and analyse what's going on at a football club. You know, he, he signed his new contract. He didn't really play a great deal after that, but he did play in the Community Shield. He didn't really feature in the in the first two games, but then he's in the team last night and, uh, you know, he, he was extremely impressive, I think. He just has this ability in a game which was mundane I think in general um, mm. for various reasons he just has this ability to spark to bring something to the team to create space to create danger he should have had a penalty quite how that wasn't given I don't know it looked as clear cut a penalty as you'll see to me but there there you go things like that happen but just that that I don't know it's just that there's a sort of maturity with the way he plays when you consider his age, when you consider his relative inexperience, that just makes me so optimistic about what he can do in another year's time or two years time, or as he starts to develop, you know, in his early 20s, when when players um, like him really start to find their feet. I think you hit the nail on the head there with maturity. And that is always the thing that stands out for me. I thought the penalty was a great example of this. He reacted like a player who's had this foul committed on him a hundred times before and 99 times he'd got a penalty. And there was the, you know, mm. the willingness to, to ball out the referee, um, the frustration, which you, you just tend not to see in younger players. And you tend not to see younger players that consistently make the right decision. Um, I struggle to think of a moment um, in Saka's game last night and kind of looking back on it throughout Saka's Arsenal career where I've just gone because you've, you've just made the wrong decision there sometimes the execution isn't quite there but he's he's 19 God, he's not even 20 that will come but mm. there, there was another moment um, when Arsenal kind of did a reverse of that Aubameyang goal and they drew the press from Leicester and immediately the ball went to Saka and I found myself thinking two things one Saka is the man I want carrying the ball forward in that scenario. If I'm Arteta and I have that team, he's the one I, I know will make the right decision. And he did. He made, he, he you know, skipped out, I think it was four attackers to play the ball immediately outright to Pepe. He didn't quite get the pass right. It was a really difficult pass, but as we saw in the Community Shield, he can he can make those passes and he can uh, set up Aubameyang and he, he might well have set up Pepe, but for some good Leicester defending. He is... He's just a player that I get excited whenever he picks the ball up um, and he's able to look forward. You, he's the sort that, that you can't help but kind of indulge in a little bit of hyperbole about and you start thinking back to the other Arsenal young players that have excited you over the years and you start thinking about what it was like when Wilshire came into the team. And I don't really think there's any any shame in that because you know this is the, the joy of young players entering into a team is... There's so much promise. There's so much hope. And you think, God, you know, I mean, I know they've only gotten tied down for four years now, but you just think the next four years with Bakayo Saka in this team, mm. they could be so much fun, at least until we get to the stage where every transfer window he's being linked to Barcelona and Real Madrid, <laughs> which I'm sure will come because this guy's something else. Yeah, he really is. And I think that, you know, to me is one of the real positive parts of, of Wednesday night and the young players that we have at the team. I know there's so much focus on players who aren't in the team right now. And I can, I can understand. I do understand why that is the case. I just think sometimes you get a bit too hung up on that and don't take enough time to appreciate what we do have on the pitch, you know, which isn't to say it can't be improved, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, a 19-year-old kid of that talent coming through at Arsenal is just so exciting. So, um, you know, I think he's going to give Mikel Arteta plenty to think about this season and, you know, how he's involved and how he's um, worked into the team on a more regular basis is, is one of the more fascinating aspects of, of what's to come. Going over to the other side, Nicolas Pepe, his first start, he's been kept out of the team in the first two Premier League games by Willian. What did you make of of his performance? Um, I know he was involved in the goal, or the opening goal, and it was good strength and good persistence and perseverance and a little bit of good fortune when the ball uh, went in off Christian Fuchs. But it seems strange yeah. to say that a £72 million signing has got something to prove to a manager or, or what have you, but um, it feels like he kind of does just at the moment. I just, I can't, I can't put my finger on it. And it's, 
it's frustrating that you have to see him through the price tag, but when the price tag brings with it such opportunity costs of things that could have been done elsewhere, it's only fair to to judge Pepe at the standards of a £72 million player, particularly going into year two. There can't be the same mitigating circumstances that there were there were last season. And I also kind of have to remind myself that at the end of last season, he was very, very good. Yeah. He looked, I thought the, the FA Cup final was his best game in an Arsenal shirt. And I was really excited to see how, how, how season two went for him. Um, and this is only an early, early view of him. I, I, I worry that, the, <laughs> this is the other thing about the price tag, I worry how much that weighs on him. Do you think and it I does? Other things weigh on him. I'm, I, my mind keeps going back to what he said after the Man United game away last season where he's quite open about how he struggles with his confidence a little bit. And, um, you know, that it, it all the talk about him weighs on him. And there has obviously been talk with him being out of the side. And I kind of think that got to him. And I felt like last night he was forcing it a little bit. Uh, he, he was, much like Nelson, he was constantly looking to make that big impact, to, to take on three players and score. Uh, but then when he got to the position to score, there was that chance in the first half. It, he didn't quite seem sure of himself. Um, part of that just comes down to this fundamental fact that he really doesn't seem to have much of a right foot at all. Uh, yeah, I was going to stop you here and just I was going to ask you about this next, but you've touched on it. So mm. when he plays in the position that he plays in, you know, I look at him pick up the ball and I kind of know what he's going to do, right? Yeah. I know... Uh, that he doesn't like using his right foot for very much at all. Um, he is very one-footed. And when you're playing in that position, in this particular system, it means that you are extremely predictable for opposition defences, which isn't to say that he isn't a very talented footballer. He is, and he's got some lovely skills, and he can produce really nice moments. And, and we see that when he's got time on his left foot, in the right positions, he's capable of scoring brilliant goals. He's capable of creating goals, as he did towards the end of last season for Aubameyang. It looked like there was a good partnership happening there. Um, but there was a sort of sameness, if you like, about where he is effective. So could Mikel Arteta be thinking about potentially using him somewhere else to make him less predictable and perhaps a little bit more effective or if we leave him where he is on that right hand side playing like this where a lot of the time he's going to be facing up defenders rather than as he did at Lille very often run into space where there were no defenders and then coming in on his left foot and scoring goals made him look uh, a brilliant counter-attacking player which he was there you know it's it's a different kind of football for him so how much is the onus on the manager to use him in a way which might get something different out of him. It's, it's a real challenge. And I remember before lockdown, Arteta talked about working hard with him on him being able to do more than just that one thing. There was a moment as well, it was around the Brighton game, where he, he, he committed for a while to trying to beat players on the outside, even if it was mostly with his left foot. And that made him really effective. I remember in that Brighton game, almost every run he did was outside his fullback. And by the time he scored, you know, the, the fullback wasn't quite sure which way he was going. Mm. I fear that if you park him on the left, you'll end up with the same problem, except he, when he goes on his left foot, he's drifting away from goal. It is a real challenge. The, the, the thing is, there are still good things that, that Pepe does, and, and much like the other player that we'll come on to talk about. I think when, when you question him, certain supporters and, and certain people on social media – assume that you are saying he is a bad player. I don't think Pepe is a bad player at all. And I think I'm sure that there will, there will be a, a system with time that you can construct that can get the best out of Pepe. Off the top of my head, I don't know what it is, but you know, I'm not paid hundreds of thousands of pounds a week to work that out. Mm. Um, whereas Mikel Arteta is, and he's, he's worthy of perseverance because as you say, this is a guy that can finish any chance when it, it comes his way on his left foot. Um, I don't. I just don't know what the answer is. I, I find it confusing that Arteta doesn't use his 
his right-sided wing back as much to overload, mm. you know, to have a Bellerin or a Maitland Niles go on the outside. Um, and that kind of distracts the the fullback and allows Pepe to drift in a bit more. Because at the moment, it just feels like this team, the, the strongest 11 is so set up to allow a Bamiyang to cut inside that it kind of just, the acceptance there is, well, we'll have to negate Pepe doing that on the other flank because you can't quite have two people doing that exact same thing or the, the middle gets congested. Yeah. Maybe it's, maybe the, the hardest thing is is that is having um, a Bamiyang on off the left just kind of it then doesn't work with Pepe. I don't know. Mm. You, you have to persevere with him because you've invested an awful lot in him and he is a talented player. But I don't quite see how with the current team and the current formation, I don't quite see anything that makes me think we're going to get the leap anytime soon. I hope I'm wrong, um, but I don't see that leap coming off the basis of the last couple of games. Mm, it is going to be very interesting. You know, people people had doubts over, um, you know, aspects of his game last season, and I can understand that. I think there were good things about him, and I think, you know, that he finished with our, uh, I think it was our second most productive player when you combine goals and assists. I think he had a lot to deal with last season, a new country, all of those things, as you mentioned previously, the mitigating factors, they're not there now, or they shouldn't be quite as um, pronounced now, because I think um, we are looking for him to produce on a more consistent basis. It's just it's just difficult to see quite how um, it's going to happen, um, considering how easy at times it, it seems to be to play against him. And maybe that's to do with what's around him as well and everything else. But it's it, there's a... What's it, what am I going to say? I think there is a, a sort of a weight on him this season to really show. And I don't like using the price tag because it's done now. It's done and dusted. But um, to show that, that he can be a regular, consistent first-team player for Arsenal. So uh, it, it is one of the many challenges that Mikel Arteta faces uh, this season. Just very finally, I know we, we probably shouldn't, but we might as well, given you did ask the first question about Mesut Ozil not being in the team or in the squad last night. Mikel Arteta, very, um, <laughs> he said, I'm very happy with the players who were here, whatever it was. I mean, he didn't even... Uh, dignify, not dignify, but he didn't want to talk about Mesut Ozil. Uh, some of your um, journal, journalist colleagues followed up and we did get a little bit more from him um, about the uh, the absence of Mesut Ozil. I guess, um, like many of us, you don't know definitively what's happening. So I don't think we can talk in any great detail about mm. it. But would it be reasonable to suggest that if Mesut Ozil can't get into the Arsenal squad for a Carabao Cup game against Leicester on a Wednesday night, the week before we go to Anfield and play Liverpool, it's extremely difficult, barring some kind of crisis or injury crisis or whatever it might be, to see how he's involved for anything more substantial. Yeah, I can't say it. I mean, this is Arsenal. Um, and we've, you know, I've learned never to try and predict anything because something bizarre will happen, but... It's just, it's, it's, it's been and gone. Um, I, I don't really think he will, he will feature again. Uh, I think, you know, going back to the the press conference because I know Özil is divisive, and b- believe me, when we ask questions about Mesut Özil, we're acutely aware that for some people this is the biggest issue at Arsenal. For others, it's an irrelevance now because they're of kind of the view of, of of some within the club that why are we still talking about this is not part of the plans. I just would. I just think it's very important that for the supporters who, through Sky Sports subscriptions and through it, their, their season tickets until this season, have kind of helped pay those wages, and, and just also because it, it's not conducive to to anyone to just keep this as a, a strange, vaguely secretive approach. There just needs needs to be a little bit more clarity from Arteta, and right now he doesn't really have any excuse for not giving that. Clarity. He's now the first team manager. It, it's up to him to explain these things now. Not, not Raúl Sanye. Not really Edu either. Mm-hmm. And they, um, Arteta and Edu have both alluded to questions over his training. Um, but it's a lot of alluding to things. It's a lot of half answers, and we we get 
halfway to an answer. But then I, that that doesn't you serve supporters well. That doesn't serve the media well. Doesn't really serve Arsenal well. It would be very helpful to just bring a little bit of clarity to this, even if it's just to say, look, you know, it it might doesn't have to be <laughs> complete truth. If you just say. Messett's in the final year of his contract. We don't intend to offer him an extension. He knows that. Um, and for that reason, we want to look at players with a long-term future. Well, that's fine. That You know, you're not, you're not spoiling uh, anything. You're not giving anything away. You're not acting improperly. Mm. It just... If, if Mikel Arteta really doesn't enjoy an- answering these questions about Ozil, the best thing to do is just to answer it once. And it's much more likely to go away because I'm certain that in his pre-Liverpool press conference, he's going to be asked about Ozil again because the sense is he hasn't given a convincing answer on it. And I'm sorry, I know I know that you, Mikel wants to talk about tactics and he wants to talk about um, you know Liverpool and what how you know things like that. But ultimately, there is a lot of interest out there in, in Ozil. It's important. He's the best paid, paid player at the club some degree of clarity would help an awful lot. It would help Arsenal and it would it would help their supporters. But yeah, mm. uh, the question won't go away until he gets a clear answer. But ultimately, I don't think we're going to see him back on the pitch unless there's some remarkable injury crisis. Yeah. Look, I, I can't disagree with that. The clarity would be extremely useful for everybody. You might wonder if there's a reason why everything is being kept so vague that we're not um, aware of, but then you're sort of venturing into these... I don't mean to say conspiracy theories, but when there are gaps, we as fans and supporters and everything else, we we try and fill them with with the knowledge or the information that we have. And, um, you know, the difficulty um, from an Arsenal perspective, of course, is that he is uh, a big star. He is a huge following. Uh, there are people who love him. There are people who don't love him. Uh, and that's why this thing continues on so whether we'll get that clarity or not this season at some point we'll have to wait and see uh, for now though James you better leave it there thank you very much as always thank you thank you very much indeed to James you can find him on Twitter at James Benj at James Benj and of course writing about Arsenal and other stuff too at football.london stay tuned for your chance to win a t-shirt, one of two t-shirts we've got to give away from 44Ts.com. We'll give you the details of how to enter that competition in a few minutes' time. First, though, we're going to talk a little bit about the new signing that we made this week. A goalkeeper, Alex Runerson, who is in to replace Emmy Martinez, who joined Aston Villa, of course. He came to us from Dijon for a fee of around £1.5 million, pounds, an Icelandic international. And it's fair to say his time in France in Liga did not go particularly well. However, what was his journey from Iceland to Arsenal? What came in between? What do we know about Alex Runerson, his career, his character, and all the rest? Well, to help us with that, I'm delighted to welcome to the show Matt McGinn. Hi, Matt. How are you? Hi, very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Um, just to give me uh, give people a bit of background on you, you've written a book called Against the Elements, The Eruption of Icelandic Football. But before we go into the how and the why of that, what's your sort of background in general uh, in sort of football terms and, and your sort of um, your fan outlook, if you like? My fan outlook is, is the outlook of an MK Dons fan. So right. So generally a, a uh, pessimistic and uh, downbeat outlook, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> Um, but it, in terms of my relationship with football, um, I've, I've worked previously in journalism and I'm now doing a PhD, which looks at football and identity in Galicia in, uh, in northwest Spain. Right. So a little bit all over the place, uh, but that's what I'm doing at the moment. OK, well, that's interesting. I mean, it's an interesting part of the world as well uh, and the football teams that are up there. So you're talking Celta Vigo, La Coruña, De- Deportivo, those teams? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, right. Yeah, big, you know, I think Arsenal played Arsenal played Celta a couple of decades ago, perhaps. You're probably 15 um, years ago at this point, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, both teams that, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s were uh, a, pre- a pretty big force in Spain and in Europe, but mm. now have, have sunk a bit lower, unfortunately. 
Yeah, there. I mean, there is. I think uh, Silvino um, left Arsenal to sign for Celta Vigo when there were some uh, issues over his passport. All of a sudden, one summer, so there there is a little connect uh, connection there. But and we did bring in Lucas Perez, a player who who uh, played for Deportivo, a big uh, Deportivo hero, or he was anyway. So yeah, yeah. Um, tell me this though: what drew you to Icelandic football and writing a book about Icelandic football beyond? just how much fun they were in the tournaments <laughs> and beating England and all of that kind of stuff. Why did you take it further than most people who just went, this is great? What 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 made you decide to write a book? I suppose it was born out of a curiosity of what Iceland had achieved and how they'd done it. Mm. Um, I think we were all aware, or most of us football fans were aware, um, you know, going back to Euro 2016 and even before that, 2013, when Iceland came really close to qualifying for the Brazil World Cup, but just lost out in a playoff to Croatia. I think it, it piqued a lot of people's interest about how this was possible to be done for a, a nation that's so small. You know, the parallels that are often done are to, you know, it's the equivalent pro- population of Croydon or Leicester or somewhere <laughs> like that, to put it in perspective. Um, and, and then my interest in terms of writing the book came in, in 2017, at which, which point I was working in Madrid for a Spanish newspaper, working an evening shift, um, and, and the TV was set to the channel that nips around the different World Cup qualifiers depending on where the goals are going in. Mm. And it kept going back to Iceland against Turkey because Iceland kept, kept scoring. And they ran out as 3-0 winners in Turkey. And that result, although it didn't quite secure their place at the World Cup, it, it made it very probable. Um, and and I, I wanted to read more about it. I was fascinated by by the story, found that nobody had written a book about it and thought that I'd, I'd, I'd fill that opportunity. So what, what was the process of, of putting that book together? A lot of interviews, um, trips to Iceland, talking to a lot of people. Um, I mean, how did, you, how did you start, um, you know, what was the genesis of it and, and you know, in – broad terms, I guess, without wanting to give any spoilers away or anything like that, because people can go and they can get the book and, and everything else. But, you know, where where did this start for Iceland and, and how did it develop into what it became? Um, I think that, I mean, there's a lot of layers to it, mm. which I go into in the book. I, I think essentially Icelandic culture and society are set up very well to allow people to succeed. I think um, it's a very difficult place to live historically and I think that creates a certain mentality in the population that endures now even though it's you know by by pretty much any measure a very wealthy country and and somewhere that's a, a good place to grow up um and I think socially if you look at the political system it's a social democracy that allows people to pursue their interests and and provides financial aid to do that um and that's why if you look at music football uh, weightlifting, all these different kinds of fields, Iceland produces way more talented people than it should do. Mm. Um, so, so that's, I suppose, the book, you know, looks into things like that. It looks into maybe slightly more obvious factors like investment in facilities, which means that football is now a year-round game, uh, investment in coach education. So Iceland is littered with UEFA licensed coaches. Um, so it's a, it's really a coming together of, uh, you know, cultural deep-rooted cultural factors followed by lots of very good decisions at a governance level mm. over the course of two decades. So let's talk about Alex Runerson then. And uh, he's somebody who you interviewed for the book. Uh, he has some Icelandic caps, and we'll talk about that in a moment as well. But um, in terms of where he's come from as a footballer, what what can you tell us about that? He comes from, from good footballing stock. Mm. So his dad, his dad is Runa Christensen, who is the most capped player for Iceland. He's a midfielder in the in the 90s predominantly. Uh, and the, I think the only Icelander with more than 100 caps. So, yeah, he, I mean, he comes from from very good footballing lineage in Iceland. Uh, and as a result of his, of his father being a professional footballer, he had quite a nomadic childhood. So I think he spent the first three years of his life in Sweden, then moved to Norway. And then from five to 12, he was in Belgium. And then back to Iceland after that. So although he is an Icelandic international, I think his, his formative years as a footballer probably had wider influences. How has that been of benefit to him? Because one of the things I think we, we um, sometimes overlook 
in a footballer's education is the the sort of human element, the human development as well. And young English players, you know, they don't go abroad very often. Their their horizons aren't as broadened as young Spanish kid, young French kid who comes to England, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know. I guess there's some sort of um, similarity between uh, Icelandic culture and and Sweden, uh, Norway, that kind of uh, that kind of place. Um, but I mean, has that had an impact on um, the way he's learned the game or his connection with that Icelandic culture that you've spoken about? I mean, I presume that's instilled in him by his father anyway. But you know, not growing up around it. Yeah, I think it's absolutely instilled in him from from what I gleaned when I spoke to him. I think. On a technical level, I think it was quite beneficial to him as a young goalkeeper to be in Belgium. Um, he, he told me that at that time, Iceland now, uh, the coaching infrastructure has, has moved on a level from a decade or, or so ago when mm. he would have been coming through. And at that time, there weren't necessarily that many dedicated goalkeeping coaches in Iceland, whereas in Belgium, they were set up to to coach that, that speciality. So he he certainly believes that he benefited from that. I think in terms of adaptability, I think most most Icelanders tend to be fairly adaptable to living abroad. It's, it's you know, uh, migration is a big part of Icelandic culture, whether it's internal migration, going back, going back, looking into the past when people would move around the country, depending on where the crop harvests were and then going out to sea and things like that. Uh, Icelanders have always been and continue to be pretty good at uprooting and moving to another place. And I think, yeah, I mean, it, it certainly can't hurt with his adaptation to a, a new country that he's already got experience of moving around a fair bit. Yeah, true. I mean, he started his career in Iceland and has moved to Denmark, France, and and now he's in uh, England with with Arsenal. Um, I mean, what were those early years like in, in Icelandic football? So he stayed he stayed slightly later than most young Icelanders tend to. So he was at a club called KR, which is a big historic club in Reykjavik. And he stayed until, I think, close to his 19th birthday, which is later than the trend that you tend to see. Most Icelandic youngsters will go abroad at 16 if, if they're mm. you know, of a sufficient calibre because that's the age when they get a scholarship in a foreign academy. So he hung around slightly later, which meant he, he finished his education in Iceland and maybe was slightly more mature by the time he left. Yeah, I mean, yeah, perhaps that, that's had some sort of impact on him. I think he, he actually became a goalkeeper fairly late as well. Um, he was telling me that he had appendicitis when he was about 11. And uh, as a result of that, after the, after the operation, he was out for four months. And when he came back, all of the other kids had grown a bit and matured a bit. And he was quite weak post-op, obviously. So uh, along with his parents, he took the decision to move back from midfield where he'd been playing previously, emulating his dad, mm. into, into the goalkeeping position. And, uh, and he really enjoyed it, so he stayed there. That's uh, an interesting transition. I mean, it's not unusual for players to to move positions when they start out. I think there was um, some talk of Nicolas Pepe, who's Arsenal's um, record signing, starting life as a goalkeeper before moving out outfield to become a, a winger. But in terms of um, what he's done uh, in Iceland and then moving out to to Denmark, where he began a relationship with someone who was fundamental in bringing him to Arsenal, who's the, the goalkeeping coach in Yaki Kanya Pavon, did he have other options or was that sort of seen as a natural transition at that point to go from Iceland to Denmark? Yeah, Iceland to Denmark, Sweden, Norway is a pretty mm. well-trodden path. That's the the typical path for a, you know a young Icelandic footballer is to go to Scandinavia and then mm. try and find your feet there and then move on to the bigger leagues. Um, I think you mentioned in Yaki Kanya. I think not not only was he fundamental in bringing bringing him to Arsenal. I think he was also quite important in his development while he was playing in Denmark. So he he talked a lot about how he'd have these extensive video analysis sessions after each game with with Yaki Kanya and how. How, um, as a coach, he's quite focused on the mental side, which I think is arguably more important for goalkeepers than any other position. Mm. So, what I mean by that is that he he helped Runer Alex with dealing with making mistakes, which is you know it's, it's inevitable. It's an inevitable part of being a goalkeeper. Even the best ones will occasionally have a an absolute howler. Mm. And he said Kanye was good at um, allowing him to place those mistakes in perspective. 
and realised that he could make it. You know, he could he could lose his team three points on the Saturday, but on the Sunday, he'd still wake up and have breakfast, and the world doesn't stop, and you you've got to carry on. Hmm. So I think on a mental level, I, I mean, obviously I can't speak for on a technical level what Kanye brought to his game, but I think on a mental level, I certainly got the impression that they're very close. And and the the player really values the coach's input on on his game in that respect. That's something he mentioned actually in his first interview. You know, with, with uh, the the Arsenal website, where he said basically, I've known this guy. We've stayed in contact down the years. Uh, I think it's fair to say that things haven't necessarily gone as well for him as he might have liked having left Denmark to go to France to play for Dijon and he lost his place in the team there and and things haven't gone well so he's not arriving at Arsenal on the back of being uh, you know a, a consistent solid performer at another club so talking about what uh, Kenya can bring from um, a mental point of view in terms of his psychology it's quite interesting because one of the aspects of this transfer is that uh, he, as the goalkeeping coach, has pretty much advocated for for Arsenal to sign him to replace Emi Martinez, who's gone to, to Villa and who's very popular. But he's coming in, I guess, you might say, with, with confidence kind of low, considering how things have gone for him at, at Dijon. So if there's that connection between him and uh, Inyaki Kanya, then it, maybe it augurs well to, to sort of pick things up again and start uh, to get going. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I hope it I hope it turns out like that. I think if they've had that relationship in the past, I think there's probably no better coach for, to help him rekindle the form that he had in Denmark that, as you say, has slightly eluded him in France. Um, I think he's still, if we move on to the Iceland national team, perhaps mm. on, on the back of that, I think he hasn't perhaps had the impact on the national team that people would have expected two, three, four years ago. He hasn't managed to displace Hannes Haldorsson, who is the the uh, the goalkeeper who's been in the national team for about a decade, despite the fact that he's now about 35, 36. Um, and, I, and I think I think the reason for that is not necessarily a reason that should worry Arsenal fans, because I think Runa Alex is very good with playing with his feet mm. when he was growing up. He, he played, as I understand, Nordschland in Denmark played quite a uh, possession-based. Uh, Ajax Barcelona was the way he described it to me, style of play, which meant that he had to adopt a very, um, a very aggressive position as a keeper and take a lot of responsibility in terms of starting attacks. Now, anyone who saw England versus Iceland either in 2016 or the other week will know that Iceland do not play in that way at all. Mm. They're very much about keeping a low block uh, from a goalkeeper's perspective. Pretty much everything about the game, about their their role in the team changes, apart from, you know, shot stopping and basic things like that. Mm. So I think, I think he perhaps has um, struggled to adapt to that very different style of play, which demands things about like long long distribution, more direct mm. distribution, which are, which are things that, that he hasn't really practiced throughout his club career. But like I said, I think those are the those are probably the attributes that have led to Arsenal signing him. So I don't think that's necessarily a cause for any particular concern um, for Arsenal fans. Yeah, I mean the 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 ability or the the requirement to play out with your feet is now um, fundamental. I think to the way that Mikel Arteta has. Uh, set up his team. Um, you know they want to play out from the back. The goalkeeper very often is is a part of that. Um, and I think obviously the uh, the arrival of Inyaki Kanya as the goalkeeping coach, as somebody who can work with players who are comfortable with their feet, is a significant part of it as well. I mean that 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 aspect of his game is something that he spoke about in his interview as well. He said he's a modern goalkeeper. He's good with his, with both feet, et cetera, et cetera. What about, you know, the, the pressure that he might feel as, you know, somebody who did go to France and had a place with a, a side and lost that place and fell out of favor there. And now is coming to a club like Arsenal, who, even if, things aren't going quite as well as they used to. It's still a big club. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of expectation. And also the fact that he he has been brought in to replace somebody that 
that Arsenal fans really loved. Emi Martinez had a fantastic end to last season and played a big role and he'd been at the club for 10, 11 years. People really took him to their hearts, if you like. So there are layers of pressure that he is going to have to deal with. You know, I don't think he's going to be playing Premier League football unless Bernd Leno gets an injury, but there's Europa League football, um, League Cup, FA Cup potentially, uh, all of which... Um, comes with the pressure that that exists at a big club anyway. Just in terms of his character and his self belief, then is this something that will phase him? Do you think? Not particularly. I wouldn't have thought. Uh, he struck me as a very, very grounded and pragmatic individual. Mm. So I don't think he'll be overwhelmed by the situation he finds himself in. I think go, linking back to what we were talking about earlier, I think the fact that in in Yaki Kanya he's got a figure mm. there who he's already already worked with extensively i think that will help that transition into into a bigger club it might not might not be quite as uh, daunting as it otherwise would be mm. um yeah I, I don't i wouldn't i wouldn't have any particular concerns about that i think he's he's a very calm individual and and, and should adapt fine uh, finally you you mentioned that he's involved with the the common goal um, I can't remember what, what you would call it. Organization is it? It's it's Juan Mata's um, set up there. So what what's his what's his thinking behind that? Beyond, I guess, just sort of some sense of social responsibility or or duty. Yeah. So he he was quite an early adopter. I think he signed up in 2017, which was when it was um, just getting off the ground. Mm. And I think he he talked about how his both of his parents were quite philanthropic and quite. Uh, socially conscious and how that rubbed off on him um and I, I i was really impressed by how how reflective he was about his role and his platform as a footballer so if we look at look for a comparison with another arsenal player bayerin is the obvious mm. the obvious one who 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 also seems very aware of that um and runer alex talked about having this uh he talked about how it was important to him to be playing for more than something more than just himself. Mm. So I suppose he was quite quite romantic in a way. He talked about how Maradona had not only played for Napoli but had kind of carried the hopes and expectations of quite a an impoverished city on his shoulders. And I think that kind of that kind of uh, idea of of, of of representing something more than just a player in a team I think appeals to him. And yeah, I, I found him to be a really enjoyable person to speak to, and one of one of the more, like I said, reflective and and, and deep thinking people that I spoke to throughout the, the whole process of of research in the book on Iceland. All right, well, look, we hope that deep thinking translates itself into uh, deep performances for Arsenal. Um, Matt, thank you very much indeed for your time. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks. You can find Matt on Twitter. He is McGinn93, at McGinn93. The book is called Against the Elements, The Eruption of Icelandic Football. It is published by Pitch Publishing, and your local independent bookstore would be absolutely delighted to get this book for you. If you can't order it via their website, just give them a call or drop them an email, and I'm sure they'll order the book for you and make sure that you get it as quickly as possible. Now more than ever, it's really, really important to support local businesses rather than gigantic, evil, behemoth corporations who just make their owner even more of a billionaire than he is already. He doesn't need to be any more of a billionaire, but the guy or gal who runs the bookshop in your area, in your town, wherever it might be, they need the business. They're paying their rates, they're paying their taxes, they're trying to pay their staff in the most trying times possible. So if you want to get Matt's book or any other book, please, please think about getting it via your local independent bookstore. Perhaps it's a little less convenient, but where are you going in a hurry these days anyway? So, look, hopefully you will enjoy the book about Icelandic football and hopefully you'll feel good in your heart knowing that you're keeping the economy going in a positive way for, for society and not just one billionaire guy.
definitely doesn't need any more money, that's for sure. Right, time to give you a chance to win one of two t-shirts from 44t.com. They've got these lovely embroidered little logos. They've got some Arsenal ones on there, of course, which is why we're giving them away. There's Thierry Henry, there's Dennis Bergkamp, there's Tony Adams, and more. The Battle of Old Trafford, Martin Keown doing his thing. So to enter the competition, all you have to do is answer this very simple question and send an email to competition at arsblog.com, right? The question is, 29 years ago this week, we signed a striker who went on to become the club's leading goal scorer of all time. Tell me the name of that striker. I know this is a particularly difficult question, but maybe, just maybe, you might be able to figure it out. Send your answer, please, to competition at arsblog.com. Competition at arsblog.com. I give you the winners on next week's show. For those of you who would like a discount on any T-shirt from 44T.com, you can do it by just using the code arsblog at checkout. It gives you 10% off. So there you go. Okay, on Monday night, we travel to Anfield to take on champions Liverpool. We've beaten them in the Premier League recently. We've beaten them in the Community Shield recently. But this is a different kettle of fish altogether. There are Premier League points to play for. To get a Liverpool perspective on this one, as well as finding out what they've been up to, what the expectations are for this season and more, I'm delighted to welcome from the Anfield wrap, it's Neil Atkinson. Hi, Neil. Hello there, Andrew. How are we doing? I'm all right, thanks. Uh, I want to ask you about, um, obviously, winning the title after such a long, um, a long time without having won the title. What was the experience like doing that in the circumstances in which it happened? Because obviously fans are not allowed in stadiums anymore. As Arsenal fans, yeah. we have some experience of it this season as well. And, you know, with the FA Cup, it's usually mm. this kind of joyous occasion. So obviously winning the title brilliant and amazing thing for Liverpool Football Club and for Liverpool fans but how, you know how did it feel in the context of not being able to sort of share that uh, sense of communion community within the stadium and everything else I think the first thing to say is that you, you, you Arsenal supporters will know well enough you win the league you don't win the league on the last week of May. Mm. You win the league in January. You win the league in December. You know, I was at Leicester away on Boxing Day when we beat them 4-0. And at that point, they were second in the league. And Liverpool had just come back from Qatar. And I knew then that was the day. And, and that end, that away end, knew then that Liverpool were going to be champions, that it was all but done. And if you had any remaining doubts, there's a goal against Manchester United scored by Mo Salah when he runs through the length of the pitch. And then the game after that, we go to Wolves and we win 2-1 at Wolves. So you sort of knew by the end of January, Liverpool were going to win the league. And you'd had that experience. It really was just a matter of ticking the games off. And even then when it was remote in, in the first place, it was great, obviously, to get the job finished. That felt fantastic. There was a little bit of, you know, on the night it was confirmed against Chelsea, there was a bit of people uh, spontaneously sharing that with one another. I went down to the beach. You forget that Liverpool's got a lot of coast. Mm. I went down to the beach. We had a great time. Fireworks. Uh, someone played Ness and Dorma whilst we put a rocket on. And I'll genuinely remember it in a way that is different from it being another big night out in town, if you see what I mean. Mm. Where it's now getting difficult, I think, is the idea of not being able to go to an away ground or go to Anfield and watch the champs. Mm. And that's where I think now for a lot of Liverpool supporters, even for those who are, who are scattered around the globe, there's a lot of people who come to Liverpool for one game a season um, and have a fantastic time. And there is, you know, their, their supporter experience is as valid as anyone else's, but that is obviously jeopardised. Those people might now may never get to watch this team play as champions. We all might not get to, but mm. at least we've got a chance with season tickets and so on. And so I think in general, the the vibe is now, I think for a while, everyone was able to power through. Everyone was able to be optimistic. Everyone was able to make the best of it. But I do think there is a bit of a thing now where I think one of the reasons why Liverpool supporters are a little anxious is the general sense of anxiety with the idea of, well, what if we never get to watch this team when they are champions? Because that is now a really valid point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's something similar um, going on with, with Arsenal in a way, like fan the fan experience, of course, fans who come for one game a season and, and now can't or maybe had plans to come and mm. can't do that. But we have, you know, in um, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, for example, a, a world-class player who really dragged us over the line towards the end of last season and the team yeah. won the Cup and we have uh, you know, a lot of experience of winning the FA Cup in recent seasons and it's great and I'm not downplaying it in any way. But Aubameyang... You know, his goals um, in the semi-final and the final um, helped us win the cup. He's signed a new deal. Um, he is 
loved and cherished by the fans and it feels like a real shame that there isn't that yep. interaction that that you normally have and i know they they have social media they have the ability to be contacted or reached by fans and also reach fans themselves but it's sort of colder it's more impersonal if you like and and the, the sort of warmth that generates from the stands from uh, you know, fans towards a player, towards a team, the same way that it would happen with Liverpool fans, you know, the first game of the season when you're taking to the field as champions, it's not there. And it's it's a shame for fans. It's also a shame for the players as well and, and for the teams. Yeah, it's the play all the way through last season. It was the players, you know, towards the end of the season and when football came back, what I was saying whenever I was doing anything was it's the players I feel sorry for in that we all got to get drunk after we beat Leicester. We all got to go and have a big party after we beat Manchester United and have that moment of communion together. The players, for them, that happens on the open top bus tour. That happens in the ground mm. immediately after the thing's won or it happens after the first game of the season when they've just heard their names be sung as champions for 90 minutes. And that's what they haven't got to have. But we're now at the point where we haven't, and this all always sounds you've got to be we're not careful because i think it's fine but it sounds very 1950s we haven't got to acclaim our heroes and that is genuinely you know when you think about the emotional enterprise that we all go through that mm. sort of give and take it, it, it there is an emotional transactional part of this and the moments of acclaiming your heroes and them paying it back to you and then some matters and it's mm. part of this enterprise and i think that that's something which which is being lost and it isn't as simple as you know a lot of this stuff sort of always for me ends up being a, an argument, uh, an unnecessary argument at times around the sort of the value of supporters or it being a, a monetary value. But there is an, an emotional exchange yeah. that has disappeared and it is a two-way one. And I think all the best football clubs have that two-way experience. Sure. And all the football clubs that are functioning have that. I remember uh, Arsenal Man United, one of the early games under Arteta last season and Lacazette almost falls off the pitch. He's exhausted, but the crowd are up and they're absolutely like the salute in the performance. He's just put in mm. granite jacker's redemption doesn't make sense unless players unless the crowd is present and it does across the course of that game and so on and so forth and there's lots of examples of this and that's what we're losing yeah look and i think it would be um wise to make the point that this isn't just something that's predicated on success that only oh. teams who have had success can can deal with because every fan of every club is missing that connection with their team you know yeah. whether they're successful or not you know the 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 highs and lows and the emotions of football exist whether you're at the bottom of league 2 or you're the top of the the premier Pretty league so. so look it is one of those things we're all having to deal with in our own way and it's one of the difficulties of football um you know particularly this week I was watching the the Carabao Cup game um when Arsenal beat Leicester and there's, you know, I think we can deal with the lack of fans much better for Premier League games in a way because there's still this kind of, whether it's residual or not, there's this sheen of glitz and glamour and interest in the Premier League. But when you're watching a Carabao Cup game, a cup tie with no fans, no atmosphere, no um, piped in crowd noise or anything like it, it's very difficult to get um, invested in it the way you might do usually. But look, that is the way the world is right now and fingers crossed we come through it uh, quickly and fans can get back in and everybody can be safe and, and healthy um, and things can get back to something approaching normality what I want to ask you is Liverpool's last two seasons have been pretty extraordinary in terms of what you've produced in Premier League terms you know to have done what you did in the season that you lost out to Man City by a point or whatever it was in the end it was an incredible run of form, an incredible points tally, and you still didn't win the, the title. And obviously last season you put that right with, um, you know, a brilliant um, consistency and, uh, you know, motivated, I would say, in some ways by that hurt, by missing out um, the previous season. So the consistency that you've shown is incredible. How can Liverpool keep that up? Can they keep that up? What is going to be the driver for this season? I think the driver for this season is in part what we've just been talking about. I think they will want to be top and clear when we can all congregate as people again. I think they'll want to be champions for that. I think it's almost, it's one of the easier sells in terms of retaining the title. I think that very few sides have retained the title in the last sort of 12, 13 years. Mm. And I think one of the reasons why is the emotional going to the well. I think for Liverpool at the moment, I think the, the driver is you need to be top for when these people can next see you. You need to be champions for when these people next see you. You need to have that moment, the very moment that you haven't had 
had to, got to have. Mm. You can you can use that. You can have that power you because we haven't had that communal moment yet. The manager's talked about doing a parade um, as and when we can do a parade and it's safe to do so. And he says, we'll do it whenever we want. We make the rules. He's right about that, but it looked after in a parade if he was sixth. Mm. So I think that there is a there is a thing there where I think that'll be part of what that squad's all saying to one another. But I also think there's a this is one of those areas where our clubs, and I mean that with with, with reference to Liverpool and Arsenal, I actually think have stuff within their DNA which says you go and do it again. And you keep doing it and mm. there'll come a point where that will stop. But I think that, you know, there is something where you are, if you want to be, if you want to be genuine Liverpool legends, for instance, well, there's lots, you know, Paisley sides won six titles in nine years. That's the, that's the, that you can, you can say that that's the benchmark. Now, listen, I actually don't agree with that, but I think that that's how you keep the side, get it stay, staying consistent and get it go going again and working it all through. And I think you're also able to say, lads, a fair few of you haven't even reached your peaks yet, your personal peaks in terms of age, in terms of what you're actually capable of. You know, Liverpool last season were, Liverpool are the best team in the world at nil nil. I'd even say Liverpool are the best team in the world at one nil in either direction. Uh, but they're the best team in the world at nil-nil. And that's what they've done brilliantly. Last season, Liverpool won a lot of games, but they won a lot of games by one goal. And they didn't play mm. brilliantly in tons of them. They were just remarkably consistent, as you say. And I think that there'll be a lot of players there who will feel as though they've got at least one more very big season at Liverpool. Um, and I think that that's what will also be driving them, that idea of personal attainments as well, as well as the collective. What about, you know, when, when you are a, a- a team that is trying to um, retain a title, how you keep things fresh and how you um, build your squad um, to sort of keep players on their toes is really important. Now, in the the sort of market that we're existing in right now, the the financial aspect of what clubs can do in the transfer market is, is still sort of up in the air. Sometimes it feels like nobody will be able to do anything, but Liverpool have spent quite big. Um, you know, they brought in Diego Jota from Wolves, Thiago, yep. who is a sensational signing from Bayern Munich, and I think really adds uh, an extra layer, an extra dimension to your midfield. There's a left back has come in. So how pleased are you with the recruitment um, that Liverpool have carried out thus far? Because I, I feel like and I see this a bit with Arsenal fans and we have, I think, bigger issues to solve than you do in terms of what we do with the squad. But there is this laser focus from fans on how a club operates in the transfer market. Um, In some ways, it feels a bit distorted or a bit too weighted towards what a club does in a transfer market um, without looking at what a club does on the pitch in a way. Yeah, I think that that's really a significant point and one I'd agree with, despite the fact that I'm you know, very pleased with the, the signings and the business Liverpool have done. Uh, on the general sort of side of this, Liverpool, like all businesses at the minute and like all football clubs, we think a lot about cash. And it feels as though Liverpool have sent Keanu Hoover to Wolves um, to effectively pay for the first year's cash for Diego Jota in terms of what's in the public domain. Thiago is only five million quid up front and Shimikas is offset by the fact that we've let Dejan Lovren go. Hang on, five million quid up front? Really? Yeah, that's all that was for Thiago. Yeah, the only they've only played, paid five million quid of the transfer fee in the first year. So I think Liverpool have been very clever and it wouldn't surprise me if in a cash flow sense, Liverpool actually end up year one on the business they've done this summer, mm. uh, making money and bringing money into the club. Now there'll be other fees attached to that, agents fees and signing on fees and so on. But I think it, Liverpool are always trying to be clever with the business. In terms of keeping it fresh, Liverpool bought Takumi Minamino last January uh, and mm. they promoted Nico Williams and uh, Curtis Jones to be more prominent members of the first team squad uh, as youth players who've come through. Nico Williams maybe isn't entirely ready for big games at right back yet. Uh, but uh, that said, I think he can, you know, there's certain games you can select for him over the course of the season. Season. And then there's also Harvey Elliott in attack as well, uh, who may well have a role to play uh, across the course of this campaign, even though he's only 17. So Liverpool have been able to, to freshen it without without feeling as though they've got to go make six big money signings. And I think that that's valuable and worth pointing out. In the general sense, I do agree with that, you know, the work Mikel Arteta does, the best work he does will actually be with a core of the players who he inherits, at least for the first two or three seasons whilst he's Arsenal manager. And that's worth remembering. Mm. The idea that managers should come in and sell 11 and buy 11, I think you can do that, but you can do it over a period of three years. And in the meantime, you've got to be able to get results, but you've also got to be able to get your ideas and your culture and your wants and needs over to footballers. And I think that Arteta looks from the outside, at least, to be doing that brilliantly. And I think the focus on transfers, on the new shiny, thing is something which I think 
doesn't help um, managers when they're in in certain positions, and it doesn't help teams. I don't think either. I, I, I think that a lot of what Klopp's done brilliantly, you know, for instance, Lallana's only just left this summer, but he had Henderson, he had Milner within there, he had Roberto Firmino when he first came in, Coutinho who obviously moves on, but he had a lot of players. D- Divock Origi plays Klopp's first game. He's still at the club. He might move on this summer. Mm. But the point is that he's got a tune, and not just got a tune, but made all these players that I've just mentioned at one moment or another or consistently excel. And that, you know, yeah, we cannot sort of see football. The purpose of football is not to identify weaknesses within the squad to be addressed in the transfer market. The purpose of football is to win football matches and managers have to do that with the players that are in front of them. And you cannot change 11 of them in one window. There is, that doesn't, unless it's Roman Abramovich, that does not happen. And I think that that's sort of, it's important for us to remember, not least to go back to the other, the thing that we started, the emotional aspect of all of this, you know, we should be, into these players. These players are important to us, their journeys, their lives, they they should be important. And I think having a sort of a philosophy that just wants to cast one or two or three or four, or in some extreme instances, 14 of them aside at the first time of trouble. Well, that's not how you build a football team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think that's uh, reasonable. There are some players, I think, in a squad, uh, in a team, perhaps that hasn't performed to the level that you would like, who... Who look, fans do need to see the back of in a way. Mm, They've had their journey. Their journey has come to an end. They need to get off the bus, if you like. Um, Unfortunately, uh, some of them uh, are are kind of difficult to move for various reasons. (laughs) But um, if you had an area of concern about the Liverpool squad, or do you have an area of concern about the Liverpool squad, what might that be? Oh, I mean, listen, you can make an argument we we could do with a fourth choice centre half, but when James Tarkovsky is going for, you know, when Burnley are asking for 50 million quid, it's quite difficult (laughs) to make an argument around, you know, we'd be a perfect fourth choice centre half for Liverpool, James Tarkovsky, but obviously he wants to start every week, but also Burnley can can request that sort of money from and another Premier League club Mm. will pay it. So, you know, it would be nice to possibly have that because uh, Matip is is quite injury prone uh, and and Joe Gomez loves a bit of a knock as well at times. So right side of centre half there uh, is, is a minor concern. Concern. Um, we've got to see how Jota does. I think that could solve the idea of having someone who can challenge and add to the front three. I think that can help massively. Um, and as I said before, you know, I think it's a big, and I think we saw it in the Community Shield. I think it's a big ask. Uh, for Nico Williams in certain games this season to just step up and be second choice fullback uh, on the right hand side um, I think we can manage his minutes and manage his opponents so he's not exposed as he was in the community shield you know it's a, I, listen I'm sure he learned a hell of a lot from it but mm. you know Obama Yang is not a footballer you want to have your 11th game against especially when <laughs> there might be a mild question mark about your pace so you know I think that that's I think that that could well be a, a thing as well from Liverpool's point of view but for now they will say Nico Williams is the is is the second choice uh, option behind Trent Alexander-Arnold. If Trent Alexander-Arnold broke his leg for three months, I suspect a midfielder would be repurposed and sent out to right back to cover that for that duration of time. But as it is for now, you know, for instance, we've got a we've got the Carabao Cup game against Lincoln tonight. Nico mm. will start. He'll do really well. Next week, when if we get through, uh, when we face one other in the Carabao Cup, Nico <laughs> will start. I suspect he'll do reasonably well. And it wouldn't surprise me if, for instance, when we get our Champions League groups, the third, the bottom seed, if they're a weak inside, Nico starts those ones to rest Trent Alexander-Arnold's legs. Mm. That that's how it'll work, uh, but you know you can easily say, well, if something bad happened to Trent, that would be something that Liverpool, where Liverpool would suffer. Yeah, well, look, that's the thing about having really good players in key positions that yeah. it's very difficult to to match that kind of quality in your your second choice. I think our Arsenal have a similar issue with Kieran Tierney and say Kalasinac, for example, at the moment. So, yeah. you know, that's that's a reality that you know many clubs have to deal with. Can I ask you a bit about Arsenal? I mean. We've beaten you twice in the, <laughs> in the last couple of months. Now, the one at the Emirates was um, fairly fortuitous. Liverpool made defensive mistakes, which you weren't making at all before you won the title. And look, that's normal. I think players switch off a little when the title is won and the circumstances were a little odd. Community Shield was a very interesting game. It was good and competitive. You know, you can chalk it down to a preseason friendly if you like. And I think that's fair. At the same time, though, when the two teams are out there, they both wanted to win. You could see that. Um, yeah. So it was a good competitive game. What what do you make of Arsenal now as opposition um, in comparison to maybe 12 months ago? And just your thoughts on what Mikel Arteta has done since he's come into the club. 
The first thing is the 5-2-3 that Arteta played against us in both of those games. There's a fair body of evidence that the games we've found toughest over the last 18 months or so, sides have played 5-2-3 against us. You know, Arteta wasn't the first manager to do it, but I would argue that possibly he's done it as well as anybody else has, if not better. You know, Wolves play that shape all the time, uh, but Arteta's Arsenal nailed it uh, against us in both of those games, really. I know one was a bit fortuitous and involved a bit of hanging on, but I still think that that's, you know, that's creditable and Arsenal carries a threat right the way through that game. Um, I think having the bravery to keep two back in attack in wide areas to give our fullbacks problems is, you know, to, to get players to actually undertake that when a side's under siege, I think is it takes it shows that, you know, demonstrably good coaching. And Arsenal did it very, very well in both of those games. And I think that that's a way you can at the very least put doubt into Liverpool minds is to is is to, is to play that shape and do it the way in which Arsenal did it. And I think that that's, you know, worthy of worthy of comments. Last season you turn up their game at Anfield field and under Emery mm. and you'd won two games uh, one against a uh, against two sides that one can expect to finish in the bottom half of the table um one arguably possibly a little fortuitously and I absolutely always knew we would roll Arsenal last season this season it feels very different um to be honest with you and the reason why is because as I mentioned before when Lacazette limps off the pitch against Manchester United there is no shadow of a doubt in my mind that firstly Arsenal will turn up to Anfield exceptionally well organized and with a plan but part two of this really matters. All the players will be bought into the plan. Mm. And that's what I expect to see. And they won't just be bought in, but they'll give absolutely every last drop of energy that they possibly have in order to execute it. And I'm not expecting, you know, to see Arsenal become demoralised at any stage of the game. And I'm not expecting them to to shy away from the execution of the plan at any stage of the game. And that's why I think it will be a really, really tough football match. I'm expecting, I, you know, I expect Liverpool to win. We, we played 19 games at Anfield last season. We won 18 and the one mm. we drew was against Burnley after lockdown and after we'd won the title, as you said before so listen Arsenal Anfield sorry is a tough place to go even if there's no supporters in you know there's li- literally Sadio Mane signed for Liverpool in the summer of 2016 and he's never lost a league game at Anfield get out um, really yeah yeah wow. because we, we lost one towards the end of his first season but he was injured at the time so he's literally never lost a league <laughs> game at Anfield neither's neither Mo Salah neither's you know Fabinho neither's Virgil van Dijk the list goes on these players have never lost a league game at Anfield so I'm obviously it would be mad if I wasn't confident sure but the one thing I know is that Liverpool will be getting a scrap and they will get to quote John Barnes 90 minutes of sheer hell from Arsenal they'll get no peace they will be uh, bullied all over the pitch where mm. Arsenal can do it they'll try and do that and I think that's what's different from what I can see from the outside I think this is an mm. Arsenal side who are fully committed to every word that comes out of their manager's mouth I think you're right and I'm sorry to tell you this but the law of averages suggests that it's got to happen at some point. These oh, guys it has, are yeah, lose yeah, yeah. It's a, sort of Damocles hanging over your head, isn't it, you know? Well, you, you've made it happen now, Neil, so I thank you in advance for the three points we're going to Sadie pick up. will kill me. <laughs> Look, it's going to be a big game. It's uh, very early in the season, but Arsenal versus Liverpool, a kind of top-of-the-table clash. I know we're over yep. overthinking this, but it's good to have it back. Uh, thanks a million for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew, and as ever, all the best with the podcast and everyone listening. Thank you very much indeed to Neil. You can find him on Twitter at Knox underscore Harrington and at the Anfield Rap, which is at the Anfield Rap with a W dot com. Not a lot else to say because this has been a pretty long episode and we have a, I guess what you call a free weekend because we're not playing until Monday night. That means that the Arsecast Extra will be on Tuesday. So myself and James will be here after the game at Liverpool to discuss whatever goes on at Anfield. Hopefully we can make it three in a row. Hopefully this is the first game that Sadio Mane loses at Anfield. It has to happen at some stage. Just has to. So, you know, it might as well be Monday. Just get it out of the way. Then you can reset, start again, go on another run, etc., etc. And everything will be hunky-dory, especially from an Arsenal point of view. Anyway, we'll see what happens. In the meantime, have yourselves a great weekend. Thanks for listening, as always. And we will catch you on the next one. Until then, cheers. Bye-bye.
Now on ITV, it's time for the latest installment of your favorite aristocratic family. Let's find out what's going on at Jewsbury Hall. Mr. Green Lily? Excuse me, Mr. Green Lily? Oh, yes, Mr. Butler, sir. What can we do for you? Lord Brendan has asked me to ask you if you could accompany him in the drawing room as soon as possible. In the drawing room, sir, but I am just a humble gardener who does gardening in the garden. We do be having turnips for hands and that and all. Mr. Green Lily, please don't ask questions and just go to the drawing room. As you wish, sir. I better take these wellies off, though. Lord Brendan, Mr. Cartwright Butlerington said you did want to see me, the humble gardener. Oh, Mr. Green Lily, come on in. There's something I, Lord Brandon, have been wanting to talk to you about. That's right. Come on in. Sit over here, actually. Come on. Sit on my lap. There's a good boy. You're a good boy, Mr. Green Lily, aren't you? You're a very good boy. Who's a good boy? Such a good boy, Mr. Green Lily. Bark for me now. Pardon me, sir. You heard me. Bark for Lord Brendan now. Ruff, 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 Did Lord Brendan say stop? Ruff, 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 ru